Now, last during our last meeting, uh, I think we fin we talked about the mutations, right? These ones. So I just want to remind you what we're talking about. Which molecules in which molecules can mutation occur? Can it occur in DNA? Yes. RNA? Yes. Do we say mutation in the protein? We should not. Okay. The faulty protein is the result of mutation in DNA or RNA, right? Now, um, we talked about types of mutations. I want to remind you, so we have missense mutation, that substitution of uh, one amino acid to another. We had nonsense mutation when stop codon arises instead of amino acid, and silent mutation, okay, when nothing, there's no effect in the sequence, amino acid remains the same. We also had, I talked about frame shift when the reading frame, the frame that reads those triplet codons, codons that consist of three nucleotides, and this frame shifts, right? And that causes a complete change in a downstream protein sequence, right? Now, one, so, so a few very important things. Why mutation persists? If there is a change in the DNA structure, okay, like this, for instance, when intercalating agent, like I could an orange or a thidium bromide, stacks itself in the double strand helix and changes its structure, why this mutation is actually projected to to the protein, why there is an amino acid change? It's a simple question. What what is the function of DNA? Store genetic information. So what happens to DNA in the cell? What genes are getting expressed? I heard like a little whisper there. Genes are getting expressed. Okay, and if RNA polymerase during transcription reads the gene in the wrong way. Do, do you see what I mean? If it reads in the wrong way, you get a faulty protein. Why mutation can linger on in the population for a while? Because what else happens to DNA every time the cell divides? Hmm? DNA is getting copied, that's right. And if during copying the mistake is introduced, you get this mistake passed on to the next generation. Does that make sense? Think about this. I, I give the the great example. Well, I like this example because it um, kind of it shows you um, that any copying is prone to mistakes. I read it when I was a kid and kind of shocked me. I never thought about it. Um, in the Bible, there is an, an expression that it's for uh, a, a rich man, it's harder to get into the heaven than to than for a camel to go through the like opening in the needle. How do you call it? Eye of a needle, yes. Okay, so, and I never could quite grasp the idea of pushing the camel through the eye of the needle. It's, it's obvious, you know, an animal like that, not going to get through, okay? It turns out that in the original version of Bible, in Aramaic version, the phrase was not about camel, but about a rope. And that, I mean, you can get this analogy, you know? It's really hard to squeeze the rope through that of the needle. You understand where the rope comes from. But when the original version was translated into other languages and copied, there was a mistake during this process. And rope was converted into camel by some weird sequence of things. And since then we have camel. Okay? So same happens in the DNA reading. 
Okay, whether it's RNA polymerase during transcription or a DNA polymerase during replication, if there is a misreading, okay, there's a there's a mutation. Okay, so we talked about a few types of agents that can cause mutation, intercalating that um, can cause the frame shift due to the um, altered structure of the double helix, the um, ionizing or non-ionizing radiation that can introduce the strand breaks, non-ionizing introduces the pyrimidine dimer, mostly thymine, and you can imagine, so think about this, what if you introduce the mutation in the DNA? and say this mutation results in the faulty protein, is there a chance that this faulty protein will be incompatible with the life of the cell, survival of the cell? Sure. So you can, and think about that. If you take bacterial culture and start to irradiate it, expose it to the UV light or gamma radiation, there's a great chance that each DNA molecule will be affected by X-ray UV in several places. So you affect multiple genes. Does that make sense? Essentially, that's here's the explanation how you control the bacterial growth by UV light or gamma radiation. You, I, I bet you've all seen UV lamps and in dental offices, in the hospitals, and food prep uh, places. That's just to control, to limit the bacterial growth. Does that make sense? So this is the little table that shows you the different mutagens. And I'll explain what you have to know. Okay. So first of all, nucleoside analogs. As you can deduce from the name, these molecules, they look like proper nucleoside, but they are actually not, okay? So these guys can convert base pairs. So they replace, say, AT with GC. Make sense? So this is going to be a classical example of the point mutation, right? What if you change the structure of the nucleotide using the agent like nitrous oxide or nitrous acid? Again, you introduce the point mutation. Intercalating agents that we have discussed just a few minutes ago. They change the structure of the double helix, which leads to the insertions or deletions during the replication or during transcription, which leads to the frame shift mutations. Okay. And finally, ionizing radiation. Okay, can cause the breaks in the strand. And when there is a repair of the break, repair, repairs are not always perfect, especially for the double strand break, okay, repair. That may lead to the uh, introduction of mutations, frame shift mutations, mostly. Uh, it can also modify bases. Finally, the UV light can lead to either point or frame shift due to the formation of the pyramid in virus. Now, what you have to know, if I ask you what type of mutation is the nucleoside analog or nucleotide modifying agent causes, you tell me it's a point, strictly. Because you just change one to another. Does that make sense? You just change GT to a GC to AT or AT to GC. Okay? Is that clear? 
So I ask you, what type of mutation does intercalating agent cause? You tell me it's a frame shift. If the question is about X-ray or gamma ray, you tell me, you getting there? Um, X-ray or gamma ray, you tell me it's going to be double strand break or nucleotide, the pair substitution. And finally, for for the UV light, it's going to be a frame shift to point the result of formation of pyrimidine dimers. Okay, that's what you have to know. Am I clear? On several occasions, I mentioned that DNA can be repaired. In fact, replication of DNA is extremely accurate. Um, there was a study on how many mutations are introduced in one during one act of DNA replication in humans. It turns out it's about three, which is amazing. So the DNA polymerase you know, copies 3 billion nucleotides, introduces 3 mutations. That's pretty badass proof for you. Okay. Um, of course, you know, sometimes mutations are still there, as we just learned. So we're going to, uh, so, so what happens during the replication? Let's say DNA polymerase introduces the next nu nucleotide and say you have a sequence G, C, G, A, okay? So DNA polymerase is going to introduce C, sorry, C, it, it meant to be C. C, G, C, and the next one is supposed to be T, right? But what if it introduces G again? DNA polymerase has a mechanism to check if the pair is proper. If the bonds, the hydrogen bonds, are formed correctly. And if they are formed correctly, then fine. But in case of GA pair, bonds are not formed correctly. Okay? There's a certain disturbance in the shape of a helix. So DNA polymerase removes the incorrect base and adds the right one. Okay? Can this system fail from time to time. Of course it can. So sometimes wrong nucleotides are introduced afterwards. Sorry, not afterwards, but they introduced and they, they stay in the helix. Okay, now what if there is a pair in the helix that's not supposed to be there, like GA? What's going to happen to the shape of the helix? Yeah, it's going to change. It's not going to be right. Like like with Lego. If you put two parts that, you know... Huh? Oh, it wouldn't be. You're absolutely right. It would be, it would be weaker. There's probably going to be some sort of a, a separation of the strands. And the enzymes that are responsible for... The repair will find the separation, okay, and they will cut out the faulty strand and they will introduce the proper one, okay? They will introduce the proper sequence, the proper uh, residue. Now, we're going to talk about two mechanisms of the repair that can happen in the light or in the dark. In the dark, without the light source. This is an example of nucleotide excision repair. So let's say the mutation was introduced into the DNA molecule by the UV light. And thiamine dimers were formed. Okay, so the first the enzyme called helicase, we talked about it. Its function is to separate the strands. Helicase will separate 
the strands and then nuclease will cut out the damaged part of the DNA and then helicase again will remove the excised portion and DNA polymerase 1 will fill up the gap. That makes sense? So you cut out the wrong one, fill up the gap. Does that make sense? In during the light, when, when there is a light, question yes. That's the we use it as an example. So if you have that kind of a mutation, then it's going to be removed by the um, the excision repair. Cut out the faulty one, fill up with a good one. I'm going to ask you about this mechanism only because I didn't we didn't talk about anything else. So you're going to see questions about thymine dimers, if you will. Am I clear? What happens? if there is light. The special enzyme called photolyase. Mm -hmm. Photolyase. It recognizes the distorted helix and simply breaks down the bond between two thymines. Okay? So there is no dimer anymore. And proper pairing is restored. Does that make sense? So no excision, just breaking down the bond between two diamonds. Any questions about the repair? Can you can you do me a favor? Can you turn them off completely? Like those heating plates back there. The dial, yeah, just turn them clockwise. Yeah, completely just turn it. And the one there, yeah. And there are two. Um, only the left one, actually. I, I think I forgot to turn on the right one. Yeah. Can you turn it on now? Because I totally forgot about it. Yeah. Good. Fantastic. It's, that's what we need. Okay. Now, how can we identify whether the certain chemical has mutagenic properties? For this, we um, use the approach that is known as the AIMS test. Now, before we talk about AIMS test, I want to mention the new term for you. This called new term is oxytrophic organism or oxytroph. Oxytrophic organism requires a certain growth factor in the medium. So we are actually oxytrophs. Humans are oxytrophs. There are 10 essential amino acids that we have to receive with the food, right? So if we don't receive those amino acids with food, we bone it, okay? Like vitamins. We have to receive certain vitamins with the food or we develop diseases and die. Does that make sense? Same goes for bacteria. Some bacteria can synthesize, I don't know, everything. Okay. Some bacteria cannot, they must have certain amino acid or certain vitamin present in the medium. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So here's how AIMS test is done. First of all, the oxytrophic mutants are identified in the population. Imagine that you have a colony of certain bacteria that, and, and these colonies grow on the medium that contains amino acid histidine. Okay, it does have histidine. So if microbe cannot produce histidine by itself, is it going to grow in that medium? 
medium has histidine, microbe that cannot make it, can it still grow? Yes, because medium has it. Does that make sense? And then we do the replica plating. So we take a little, I don't know, just a, a stamp thing, okay? And we collect, we pretty much press this, the velvet, okay, against the initial culture. And then we transfer microbes to a couple of other plates. One of them containing histidine, one of them having no histidine at all. Now, the medium that doesn't have histidine, the microbes that cannot make it, are they going to survive on the histidine negative medium? No. Bless you. So what you do, you compare the colonies and you identify one colony that's missing. Does that make sense? That's the colony that cannot make histidine. Is that clear? Okay, it's pretty neat. So you find that colony on the histidine positive medium, which is going to be here. And you isolate that oxytrophic mutant. Do you follow me? So far. So we now have oxytrophic mutant. The bacteria that cannot grow in absence of histidine. Does that make sense? So it does have a certain mutation in it. We didn't expose it to any chemical yet. Okay, good. We didn't expose it, but we're about to. So now imagine, let's, let's say it's Salmonella. Salmonella tifimerium, and this is the way we label oxytrophic mutant, histidine negative. Okay, so we have oxytrophic Salmonella that doesn't grow in the absence of histidine. And what we do, we take this strain of salmonella and expose it to the mutagen. And then we have a control sample here, no mutagen. Does that make sense? And then we plate these cultures, unexposed, the control culture, to the left and exposed the experimental to the right. We put them on the medium without histidine. Does that make sense? Now, if we have few colonies that, you know, so this medium doesn't have histidine. Will oxytrophic mutant generally grow on the histidine negative medium? No. So we have just a couple of colonies, that's the natural mutations. Okay. If the chemical that we use, the chemical that we test, causes mutations, there's a great likelihood that the oxytrophic mutant will revert back to its wild type, phenotype. Does that make sense? No? You're more than welcome to say no. Hmm? It makes sense? I just, it's, it's really, you have to, it, it kind of tough concept. So let's go over it again and you're going to answer my questions and I'm going to ask the question. So we have a mutant, oxytrophic mutant. What does it need to grow? Histidine. 
When we say mutant, what does that mean? It has a change in the, in which mode? In the DNA, yeah. Well, in this case, since it, it persists in the population, it's probably DNA. So there's certain change in, in one of the genes, or maybe several genes. That makes sense? Now, if we expose this microbe to the mutagen, is there a chance that this oxytrophic mutation will revert back to normal, that it will, it will now start producing histidine again? Huh? Yes, there's a chance. Actually, the chance is because bacteria replicate very quickly, so they accumulate mutations very quickly. Does that make sense? So after the exposure, we played the control unexposed oxytrophic mutant. An experimental exposed oxytrophic mutant on the medium that doesn't have what? Histidine. The mutant that was not exposed to the mutagen isn't supposed to grow on that histidine negative medium. Does that make sense? The mutant that was exposed, there's a good chance there are going to be several cells that now have reverted back to the original phenotype. Does that make sense? That, that gain, they mutated again to acquire ability to make histidine by themselves. Does that make sense? So if you see the difference, if you see high number of revertants, then the chemical is the mutagenic. If there is no change compared to control, it's not mutagenic. Does that make sense? Great. Now, one thing that I never mentioned. Liver extract. What does liver do? Yes, it metabolizes, exactly. So if mutagen is not mutagenic by itself, but becomes such after it is converted to something in the liver, Liver extract will partially mimic it. That's why we add it. Make sense? Understand that idea how AIMS test is done. We need oxytrophic mutant first. You have to understand what is oxytrophic mutant. Okay. And what happens to the oxytrophic mutant when it is exposed to the mutagen it reverts to the wild type phenotype and how it is all linked to the media deficient in one of the nutrients how we select for these revertants okay now we'll talk about probably one of the my favorite topics it's uh, very relevant to the public health okay the idea of um, antibiotic resistance prokaryotic organisms archaea and bacteria do not have sexual reproduction do you agree with me what is the advantage of sexual reproduction that higher organisms have. Plants, exactly. Introducing genetic variation in a population, right? Um, but you may say, well, look, bacteria and archaea, they reproduce fairly quickly. Uh, some cells in the lab, cells like E. coli, E. coli can, in the lab conditions, it can divide every 20 minutes. So yeah, it's, it's pretty fast. And you can imagine that there's probably, there are probably mutations that accumulate during the, with each act of cell division, right? So why, why transferring, why we need such a genetic diversity? Turns out without um, any sort of sexual reproduction or something that would remind sexual reproduction evolution would be too slow 
um, for a long time, we were taught that evolution is a fairly small step process. Okay? It's not. In many cases, the changes become abrupt. Okay? They become really huge in the population. Certain change due to the gene transfer may give some organisms a huge evolutionary fitness advantage over others. And it may happen not in the span of hundreds of millions of years, but in the span of, I don't know, maybe a month or a few years. They can adapt really quickly to the changing environments. So bacteria, in order to increase the genetic diversity of, of their populations, utilize three major strategies. Transformation, transduction, and conjugation. All these three strategies are generally called horizontal gene transfer. Why we call it horizontal and what is vertical gene transfer? Let me call it horizontal. What's okay? Let's define what's vertical gene transfer. Think of, when we talk about gene transfer, we talk about genetic information, we talk about heredity, right? So vertical gene transfer is the transfer of genetic information from one generation. Yes, one generation to the next. Here we talk not about generation to generation, but about microbes that may be, as much as we can say it, of the same generation. Does that make sense? For instance, in humans, horizontal gene transfer is, we practically don't have it. We don't exchange DNA. I mean, we do during sex, but it's not so, um, after the sexual intercourse, male doesn't acquire any genes from a female and vice versa. They combine the genes to give it to offspring. Does that make sense? In bacteria, since they do not have such thing as sexual intercourse, since they cannot combine the genes, mix the genes um, in the act of sexual reproduction, they have to exchange it some other different way. So they utilize this three strategies. And the first one that we're going to talk about is transformation. So it was Frederick Griffith, don't ask me about the year. So he discovered the transformation in the organism, gram-positive microbe called the Streptococcus pneumoniae. Let's talk about the science that Griffith did. So he had two strains of Streptococcus pneumonia. One strain had capsule, one strain didn't. What is the function of the capsule in bacteria? It protects against phagocytosis. So it's a virulence factor, right? Which means it makes microbes more virulent, more deadly. More, causing more disease, right? So it turns out that Streptococcus pneumonia with the capsule killed mice. We don't have it here, but so S strain, so called S strain killed mice. Does that make sense? You just knew. And Rough strain, the R strain, didn't kill mice. Okay, so far, that, that's requisite to the experiment. Okay? Now, Griffith was wondering, what actually con confers the virulence? What carries that information about capsule? 
So uh, what he decided to do, he decided to kill the pathogenic strain, inactivate it. So he boiled them. Okay. And it turns out that when you use the heat to inactivate streptococci, streptococci do not kill the mice, you know, so, and it's kind of, kind of obvious. Does that make sense? You destroy bacteria, kill bacteria, dead bacteria do not kill the mice. Make sense? So then, he decided to mix the heat-killed pathogenic strain and non-pathogenic strain. So now, before we get to the results, from the standpoint of just common sense, from the standpoint of logic, you have live microbes that do not kill animals, right? You have dead microbes that do not kill animals. You mix them together. What would you expect? It doesn't, it shouldn't kill animals, right? Well, it turns out when you mix them together and introduce the mixture into the mice, animals started to die. So what he did next, he opened up these mice and isolated microbes that were replicating in these animals. Okay. Looked at them under the microscope and they looked just like pathogenic ones. Okay, they had capsule. And these encapsulated recovered strains were also able to kill mice. So he kind of followed the, the Cox, so called Cox path chain. So there was something that dead pathogenic bacteria were able to give to live non-pathogenic bacteria to make them pathogenic. Do you follow me so far? The capsule, pathogenicity, virulence. How do we call this? Is that a... This is a trait, right? Which is a phenotype. What is responsible for a certain trait? Hmm? A gene. So somehow, a gene responsible for a particular trait, or the trait of producing the capsule, this gene was transferred from the inactivated pathogenic strain to live non-pathogenic one. Does that make sense? So Griffith called this process bacterial transformation. It turns out that when you hit inactivate the bacteria, DNA is being released from the cell. Cells disassemble and DNA is released in the environment, right? And live cells like this non-pathogenic R strain, they actually acquire this DNA, can acquire this DNA. Does that make sense? And they can incorporate this DNA into their chromosome, for example. Or, if it's a plasmid, remember we talked about plasmid, the circular DNA that can be found in the bacterial cell? If it's a plasmid, same can happen. Okay, do you follow me so far? So, why it's so important? A couple of reasons. First, this can contribute to the transfer of antibiotic resistance genes from one bacteria to another, from one population to another. Uh, Melissa, can you do me a little favor? Can you turn it off? Marisa, sorry. So I'm learning. Sorry about that. Good. Thank you. Um, so imagine that you have microorganisms that carry plasmids with antibiotic resistance genes. When they die, when cells die, these plasmids may be released in the 
may be released in the environment. Okay, and other cells can potentially acquire those plasmids via transformation. Does that make sense? The actual acts of transformation are very infrequent. But when we talk about bacteria, we talk about numbers in billions. And even if one out of billion bacterial cells will acquire that plasmid, that's enough. That's sufficient. This cell will start to reproduce and will, will dominate the population because it's going to be antibiotic resistant. Does that make sense? Another great application of this process is transformation of bacterial cells in the lab. This is a, a, a neat technique. So imagine that we have a plasmid, a scientist. We're now scientists. We have a plasmid. This plasmid has some kind of a gene, a target gene, that encodes for a particular protein. Let's say it's hemoglobin, just out of curiosity, okay, hemoglobin. So if we just take the plasmid with just the target gene, and we will introduce it into the bacteria, if we try to transform the bacterial cells, how do we know which cells have plasmid, which don't? We have no way to separate them, right? Because we don't, we can't really see, there is no marker for this. So what scientists do, the same plasmid, they introduce the gene for antibiotic resistance. Now you have two bacterial cells, okay? And you transform them with a plasmid. This one acquires the plasmid and becomes antibiotic resistant. This one doesn't acquire the plasmid and has no antibiotic resistance then you put this mixed culture on the plate that contains antibiotic. What's going to happen to not resistant cell? It's going to die. You have only the ones that acquired the plasma. Does that make sense? It's called a selective marker. Okay. And it's, it's common, very common technique in the lab. So if you ever end up in the research lab, which I personally do not suggest to do, but if you end up there, you're going to find this technique practically everywhere. Now, that was transformation. Another mechanism of horizontal gene transfer is transduction. Transduction is done by viruses, viruses of bacteria that we call bacteriophages, okay? Basically, what bacteriophages do is they transfer fragments of bacterial chromosomes from one bacterial cell to another. Bacteriophage can exploit two life cycles. One is lytic. And I'm going to describe this cycle fairly quickly. Before we actually talk about lytic cycle, I want to ask you a little question. Bacteriophages are viruses of bacteria. What is the fundamental difference between viruses and all other organisms? They're acellular and they need something. They need a cell to reproduce. Does that make sense? So bacteriophages, <coughs> sorry, need bacterial cells. Lytic bacteriophages, they infect the bacterial cell and they kill it. They lyse it. That's why they are called lytic. Does that make sense? Now, Many, many, many new bacterial particles, sorry, new phage particles are formed during the infection. And a bacteriophage actually packages 
fragments, fra packages its own DNA in this particle. And oh, let me let me just picture it. I'm sorry. Let me just picture it. It's going to be easier. I'm going to introduce a little slide here. Okay. Now let's take a glance. So here's what happens. You have a bacterial cell. Okay. And you have a little phage right here. Okay. And this phage introduces its DNA into the cell. Okay, keep it up. Here's what's going to happen next to that DNA. DNA is replicated, okay? And also the genes that are in the phage DNA are expressed. So you get parts of the phage here and there, okay? Does that make sense so far? No? Does it? Okay. And then the viruses get assembled. Does that make sense? <coughs> they get assembled during the infection. Bacterial DNA. That's the chromosome. Bacterial DNA gets chopped up. Make sense? Just purely by mistake, purely by chance. Some of the phages, they pack bacterial DNA. Does that make sense? And then they completely destroy the cell. Those are cell fragments. And now you have phage particles. Some with the normal phage DNA and some with the bacterial DNA. These guys will go and infect another cell and will introduce bacterial DNA into the new cell. So they will transfer fragments of bacterial DNA from one bacteria to another. Does that make sense? They accidentally package the wrong DNA. Does that make sense to you? So this type of transduction is called generalized or simple transduction. Another strategy that bacteriophages use to replicate is called lysogenic. So phage introduces its DNA, which is labeled blue here, into the cell, and this phage DNA is introduced and gets stuck in the bacterial chromosome, becomes a part of bacterial chromosome. Does that make sense? Okay, and it stays there forever. Well, not forever, but for a long time. And it stays there and stays there and stays there. And nothing really happens. The cell doesn't die. At a certain point, though, these dormant, latent phage, which is called prophage, becomes reactivated. The prophage is excised, cut out from the bacterial chromosome. The excision may not be exact. So a small part of bacterial DNA may tailgate along with the uh, phage DNA. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So then when this excised page DNA is packaged into the particles right here, all these particles also carry a fragment of bacterial chromosome. That makes sense? So now DNA of these new phage particles consists of the phage DNA plus the piece of bacterial DNA. And then during the next round of replication, when this new phage DNA with a part of bacterial chromosome from the previous cell is introduced, you've got the horizontal gene transfer. <coughs> Does that make sense? So phage packages its own DNA and the piece of bacterial DNA with it. This is called specialized transduction. So in one case, we have particles that have proper phage DNA and the particles that have only bacterial DNA. In case of specialized transduction, both phage and bacterial DNA are packaged in the same particle and then introduced into the chromosome of another cell. Does that make sense? Question? No? So what you have to know about this? difference between generalized and specialized transduction. <coughs> that in one case you have cells that um, you have phages that completely destroy the cell with every round of replication okay and they hold the fragments of bacterial chromosome independently of the phage DNA and in case of specialized transduction part of bacterial chromosome gets stuck to the phage DNA and gets incorporated into the chromosome as the part of the phage life cycle. Okay. Now let's move on to the <coughs> third mechanism of horizontal gene transfer, which is called conjugation. So some cells carry so-called fertility plasmid. Okay. Fertility plasmid encodes the genes that are necessary for the conjugation. Okay, these cells are called fertility positive or donor cells. And this plasmid um, when it is expressed, when genes on this plasmid are expressed, expression of these genes leads to the formation of pili. Pili connects the donor cell <coughs> and the recipient cell, which does not have fertility plasmid. It connects them, and fertility plasmid is transferred from the donor to the recipient cell. And as the result of this process, you have two F positive cells that can further serve as donors of fertility plasmid. Does that make sense? <coughs> now, why it is so important for the public health? Conjugation can happen not only between the microbes of the same species, it sometimes occurs between the microbes of different species. Okay, so essentially if you have a microbial cell that contains fertility plasmid, and this fertility plasmid in addition to all the genes that it has for the conjugation also carries the antibiotic resistance gene. Antibiotic resistance will be spread throughout the entire population like a wildfire. Okay, so, examples of spreading antibiotic resistance. Have you heard about MRSA? I bet you have. For a long time, the idea of methicillin resistant staph aureus uh, scared the living daylights out of the doctors and, you know, patients, everybody. Now, 
microbial, the community of microbiologists, doctors, infectious disease docs, they pretty much have to admit that meth methicillin resistant staph aureus is the new normal. We just have to accept that practically half of staphylococcus staph aureus infections are methicillin resistant. It's not something outstanding that just we just have to keep it in mind. One of the great examples of antibiotic resistance that I that I read about was um, regarding the antibiotic resistant strain of E. coli found in some patients in Netherlands with a diarrheal disease. So in Netherlands they had a study so there, there were there was an outbreak of diarrheal disease. Okay, and they isolated the culprit, E. coli, and they looked at the genome and they found some antibiotic resistance genes in the human E. coli. And then um, these people didn't receive that type of antibiotic therapy. So they started to look at what was common between those people and it turned out they all consumed chicken that came from certain farms in the Netherlands. And they looked at the chicken population, absolutely, they used antibiotics. And you've got some cells were resistant, and by conjugation, they, they specified that it was a plasmid, the fertility plasmid that contained that gene, the resistance gene. The entire population of microbes became antibiotic resistant. But what was more scary is that they found other microbes of different species, like Klebsiella pneumonia, that acquired the same fertility plasmid on the same farm. It was fairly recently, something like maybe three, four years ago. Well, as far as I know, in Netherlands, the use of antibiotics in poultry is now banned. So they antibiotic free, not because they, you know, they want to sell uh, chicken and whole foods, but just because they realize that it actually promotes antibiotic resistance more than anything. Okay, that's one of the major contributors. So you have to, we all have to keep it in mind. And it applies to any type of horizontal gene transfer. Now, um, interesting feature of high frequent, uh, the, uh, the fertility plasmid is that it sometimes can integrate itself into the chromosome. Okay, and that integration leads to the formation of so-called high-frequency recombination cell, HFR cell. Okay. Now, when this plasmid is excised back out of the chromosome, the excision again may be imprecise. So this plasmid shown here now can carry another gene, the gene that it accidentally acquired when it was excised from the original bacterial chromosome. So essentially if the cell has the fertility plasmid via the act of incorporation and excision act of recombination, fertility plasmid can acquire various genes from the chromosome of the bacterial cell. And that is another way to spread the genetic information to increase the genetic diversity of the population. Does that make sense? In some cases, such HFR cells, when they form a bridge using PILUS with a donor cell, they may attempt to transfer the entire bacterial chromosome. Essentially, uh, these cells will start to treat the chromosome, their own chromosome, as the gigantic plasmid. Now, plasmids are usually not really large. There may be about 10,000 nucleotides. On the other hand, the chromosome is huge. Right? It can be 5 million nucleotides. So there's no way the entire chromosome can be transferred from one cell to another. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So at some point during the transfer, the PILUS 
here. The pillars will be broken, and only part, only one part of the chromosome will be actually transferred to the to the recipient cell. And by taking like a time, how long does it take for a particular part of the bacterial chromosome to transfer to a recipient cell? You can do a map of the chromosome. Does that make sense? No? Let's think about this. You have, a, you have a circle, you straighten it out, and you start to transfer it to the new cell. At some point, the transfer stops. So, part of the chromosome that ended up in the recipient cell. Every act of transfer will end up with a different portion of the chromosome being in the cell. And you can actually test how much of the genome entered, okay? And you can locate genes based on the time it takes for them to get transferred to the recipient cell. This is called the map of the genome. It's actually calculated in minutes. For instance, for this, this gene, it takes 40 minutes to get transferred. For this gene, it takes 80 minutes to get transferred. You can put them in sequence. Gives you some information. Now we don't need it actually because we can simply just sequence the entire thing. Okay? 12. Mm. Let me think how we should do it. Okay. Let's take a break now. We're going to talk about this later.